with sensors and signal background and saturation, all these three lectures that I give today are very much hang together. Um, <clears throat> And uh, but it's it's really uh, th this is really important uh, messages that I have to give. That one, I have to hammer it. No saturation, no underexposure. Now I think you will understand after this lecture. So uh, the learning outcomes of this lecture are: we are going to try and understand what the bit depth and the dynamic range are and also understand the consequences of having saturation and underexposure in the image, and understand how to adjust brightness, gamma, and, image, and contrast uh, in images when you want to present them. So here we have the, the typical workflow of how to set up a confocal, but we will go through this uh, together uh, anyway. Uh, maybe I mute you if you don't mind. Yeah. And then uh, you can always find uh, the PDF of the lecture. And then we will also have uh, some quizzes. OK. Sorry, I had no time to finish my coffee. Now it's finished. <clears throat> So what is the problem in this image? Um, if you, uh, to start with, it looks like everything is normal. Uh, and it looks like the images on the right side are um, very dim and the one on the right side is uh, bright. So if you uh, look at this, this is one, uh, three different channels and this is the overlay. So it looks like this one is very bright and these are dim, but the reality is different. The problem actually lies with this channel. It is saturated. So what does that mean? We're going to see this uh, in, uh, in this lecture. So if I, uh, in, in general, when you have an image in, in whichever software uh, you have, if you hover your mouse, the mouse over the image, you will get some information somewhere. Uh, so in the Nikon software, it is just at the bottom of the image. And what we can see is that if I put my mouse somewhere in these pixels, I can get some information. This is the XY position in the image. And then these are three uh, numbers here are actually the, uh, so this is the XY position and these three numbers are the uh, intensities in the three channels. And so again, this is something you can do with any software. You will always find this information when you pass your mouse in front uh, uh, on top of the image. So this is what the problem is. 4095 in this in in this uh, channel <clears throat> so what is that this is saturated uh, saturated and what does it look like what is it so we can see here that uh, wherever we put our mouse if we are above red pixels we always get this number or 4095 so all these red pixels have the same intensity and uh, if we, uh, if I remove then this red color and I look, I can see that all these uh, uh, pixels look like solid, the same exactly. There is no details at, at all in these areas. Okay, so that's not very good. <clears throat> if I look here at two uh, images of a bead, so this is a fluorescent bead and we take one image and this one is well exposed and this one is saturated. If I draw a line across and I look at the profile, the intensity profile, what I can see is that there is a texture in the bead. So it's basically, uh, it's not uniform. Uh, and you see, I can see a little shadow here, but then even in the middle along the line, I can see like some uh, intensity variations inside the bead. However, if I look at the saturated image, what I see is the flat, the top is completely flat. And there is absolutely no detail recorded inside the bead, so no texture at all. So all the red pixels have the same uh, intensity. Uh, I, <laughs> I wrote it a little bit funny there, but it's okay. I will charge. And um, uh, all right. Okay. And um, so the intensity information record, regard, recorded in these pixels is absolutely incorrect, okay? There's absolutely no details in there. So what we need to do is lower the exposure time, lower the gain, lower the illumination power, do anything that we can do so that we do not saturate. 
And when we do a Z stack, we have to be very careful that maybe uh, the image that we are looking at uh, right now, and we set all our settings so not to have any saturation, but maybe the sample is brighter above and below, and therefore we may get saturated in Z stacks. So you have to keep a little bit of allowance when you set your settings. So um, to be more aware during Z stacks or during time lapses, where uh, you, you may get saturation elsewhere. You do not want to get any saturation at all. So now uh, one problem is the uh, saturation, another one in the un underexposure. So now we've seen what saturation looks like. We get this flat top. If we, get, uh, uh, if we draw a, a line, what happens to underexposure? What does it look like? So these pixels are now uh, color coded in blue, and I will talk about this afterwards. All the pixels in blue have the same intensity of zero. Okay, so if I do not apply this blue color, this is what it looks like. Um, Underexposure is much harder to detect uh, than uh, overexposure, than uh, saturation. But uh, so when you do not have this blue color coding, it's very difficult to know that you are uh, actually underexposed. So our eyes cannot really detect this. You need the help of, uh, of uh, this mask that I will talk about later. So the art, this is an artifact. The, uh, the blue pixels are underexposed and uh, it looks like it's very nice background, but it actually will create a lot of problems for you and you can definitely not publish such an image. So there is no fine intensity in the edges. I will show you at the end of the lecture exactly what it means. And then uh, it's uh, much easier to detect uh, saturation than underexposure. It's very difficult to see that. And this is very likely to be rejected by a journal. So where does uh, saturation or underexposure, where do they come from? Um, so it's a question of dynamic range and big depth. And so now I'm going to explain the dynamic range and the big depth. When uh, how we're going to, uh, after, after this, I will talk about how to detect saturation and underexposure in an image. And we're going to talk then about lookup tables and histograms. Then I will talk about uh, uh, what the consequences of saturation and underexposures are. And it's basically, you cannot use the information. It's not, uh, it's not correct at all. And also I will, uh, uh, I will uh, tell you about how to actually change the display in the image uh, so that you can see very nicely uh, your signal. So using brightness, contrast and gamma. So this is uh, uh, my lecture today. Let's start with that. So what is the bit, re uh, bit re uh, depth and the dynamic range? So if we look in the image, and again, you find this in all software uh, at different places, but basically uh, you will always find this in the software that you're using. And that is <clears throat> regardless of whether you're using a camera, um, a camera based system or a detector based system like a single point confocal. So, uh, in the Nikon software at the bottom of the image here, we see some information. Uh, it says three times 12 bits. And basically, we have three channels. That means that each of these channels is an image uh, of 12 bits. So, what is this? I remind you what I said this morning uh, about having a good sensor. So if we have three photons and we detect only one, it means we have a not very nice quantum efficiency. And we would like to have a good quantum efficiency to detect all the photons that come in. And then this photon will uh, trigger an electron charge inside the, uh, the sensor. And then there will be an amplification process. And then the voltage is read and it's converted to a digital signal. And then that gives us the uh, digital value of our intensity in each pixel. And that is true for both uh, cameras and detector. What I'm going to talk about now is in this area. So the dynamic, dynamic range and the bit depth. Okay, we're talking about the way we convert the signal and the way we, uh, we read the signal. So let's have a look at that. Bit depth and dynamic range. So the dynamic range of the sensor, <coughs> the dynamic range is the ability of the sensor to read dark and bright areas with details and without saturating, okay? This is exactly what we want. We'd like lots of details, even in the, even the dim places, lots of details in the very bright places, and we do not want any saturation and no underexposure. So we uh, ideally, we want a high dynamic range. So let's have a look a little bit. This is a specification <clears throat> of the sensor. 
And so that means that once you have your sensor, there's not much you can do about it. And <clears throat> it is the dynamic range is a ratio of electron, the number of electrons. So it's the highest uh, number divided by the lowest uh, uh, number of electrons that the sensor can produce. Okay, and I will show you now what that means. So mini the maximum divide uh, uh, to the minimum. So what is the lowest limit? The lowest limit is the readout noise. So I spoke this morning about the fact that when we amplify and then we uh, uh, read the voltage and we convert, when we do this process of converting, we actually create some noise, which is called the readout noise. And that is the minimum. So that's the minimum signal that we can get, let's say, uh, in our image. So basically, uh, if we have no light at all, we do not convert any, any electron or whatever, we just read the voltage that we have, we're going to anyway have a few electrons that will be read, okay? And so that's the readout noise. So this is our lower uh, reading. And the highest limit is called uh, either the full well capacity or the well depth, doesn't really matter. Uh, it's also measured in electrons and it's the highest. So it is the maximum number of electrons that the sensor can produce before it saturates. Okay, so that is the highest. So for example, a dynamic range of <clears throat> 30,000 to one, means that one electron is the minimum. If we have no fluorescence, this is just the noise, it's going to create one electron. And the, when we have some signal and we amplify it and everything, once we have amplified and we go over 30,000, then the, the sensor will saturate, okay? This is the dynamic range of the sensor is therefore 30,000 colon one. So on camera-based system, we have very high quantum efficiency. I want to remind you that the quantum efficiency is the ability to uh, generate, uh, to capture basically the incoming photons. So if we have three coming, three photons that are coming from our, sam our sample, and how many of them are actually going to trigger an electron charge inside the sensor, uh, this proportion of incoming photons to uh, photons that trigger actually a signal is the quantum efficiency. And uh, I told you this morning, <clears throat> that uh, detectors that we use on signal point focals are around 35% to 45%, which is quite low. But the cameras nowadays are very much above 80% for sure. And the, the, the normal standard, let's say in the last few years is uh, definitely 95% quantum efficiency, which means that almost all the photons that come to the, uh, the sensor are actually triggering an electron charge. So very high quantum efficiency. And the exposure time is in milliseconds. What does that mean? So we have maybe 100 milliseconds, 50 milliseconds exposure time. It means that over 50 milliseconds, we accumulate photons. So we have an accumulation of photons uh, on the chip. And then after these 50 milliseconds or 100 milliseconds of exposure time, then the chip is emptied and red, and then we can expose again. Okay. So because we have an accumulation for some milliseconds and a very high quantum efficiency, the number of electron goes very high. So cameras require a high dynamic range. And um, <clears throat> if you have a camera with a low dynamic range, it's going to saturate very, very quickly. So you will not be able to take, maybe if you want to uh, acquire an image at 500 milliseconds, you will saturate the camera. Um, so, um, if we use now detector-based systems, so single point confocals, remember they have a low quantum efficiency, about 35%, 45%, something like this. And also the time that they stay, uh, the laser stays on each uh, pixel before it moves to the next pixel is very short. It's in microseconds. So this is the pixel dwell time. The pixel dwell time is microseconds. So as I said this morning, the pixel dwell time is a little bit similar to exposure time per pixel. Whereas in the camera, we expose all the pixels at once for some milliseconds. Here, we stay on each pixel for some microseconds. 
<clears throat> on top of that, the electrons in a detector based system, they are read on the fly. So there's no accumulation on the uh, inside the detector. It's just immediately the voltage is read all the time. So detectors do not require such a high dynamic range as cameras. So it's okay for a detector have to have a low dynamic range, but for a camera, we need a high dynamic range. And the, um, the signal generated is in number of electrons, okay? So we're all talking about things that happen inside the sensor. And we are talking about number of electrons, the highest and the lowest. And uh, this is not the same thing as the intensity values, right? So the dynamic range is a characteristic of the sensor. And, um, and it's not the type of intensities that you have inside the image. So you're not going to have an intensity of 30,000 in your image. That's not what it means. <clears throat> it's different from the intensity in the image. It's inside the, 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 um, the sensor. So what are the advantages of having a sensor uh, with a high dynamic range? Well, you can image bright areas without saturating and still get details in the dim areas. So the type of samples that require a, uh, a sensor with a high dynamic range would be samples that have a very dim and very bright areas. This is quite common that it happens that you have some areas you want to get details in both of them, but you have very dim and very bright areas in the same image. And or samples that change intensity a lot over time. For example, you have, uh, <clears throat> you express the protein and you want to follow the expression of the protein over time, then that changes. Uh, the disadvantage of uh, high dynamic range uh, sensors is that uh, the imaging is slower. So um, <clears throat> what can we do to increase the dynamic range? I said this is a characteristic of the sensor. Once you have bought the sensor, that's what you have. But there's still something we can play with. It is uh, uh, the noise uh, because the dynamic range is, so the maximum you cannot really change because this is the characteristic of the sensor, but the lower part is actually part of the noise. And so if you can decrease the noise, you will increase your dynamic range. So to increase the dynamic range, you need to, if you have uh, on the camera, uh, you can lower the readout rate. If you lower the readout rate, you will lower the readout noise. And therefore, uh, you will have slower imaging, but you will have a higher dynamic range because this guy will go down. Um, <clears throat> so now I explained the dynamic range that's part of the sensor. Okay. Um, how, how can we uh, avoid saturation? What is the maximum number of electrons that we can get before we saturate? Now uh, I'm going to talk about bit depth and explain what the difference is. So when we read the voltage, so we read the number of electrons in the sensor, and then afterwards we convert this to an intensity value uh, in the image. And uh, so we get an intensity value for each pixel in the image. So the bit depth in the image this time, so dynamic range belongs to the sensor, bit depth belongs to the image. The bit depth um, of the image uh, is the number of possible intensity values in the image, okay? So uh, what can be the minimum value, the lowest value in this image, what could be the highest value? And this is set in the software, and therefore this is a choice that you make when you acquire the image. So that is very different from the dynamic range the highest part of the dynamic range you cannot change. You can try to play a little bit with the readout noise uh, in the software. Uh, however, for the bit depth, you can change it. So um, <clears throat> on both detectors and camera systems, you can change the bit depth when you acquire. You have to change. You change the you decide on the dynamic range before you acquire, but this uh, can be also changed after acquisition. And I will explain, it can be downgraded after acquisition, but you cannot create data, obviously. Yeah? So what does that mean? The, um, for example, it's a little bit of a, like a staircase. If we have a uh, high dynamic range, it means that there is a big difference between the minimum number of electrons that we can acquire and the maximum number of electrons we can acquire. So we can say we have a very high staircase. So this is a high dynamic range sensor. And we have here six steps. 
And in this low dynamic range sensor, where we have <clears throat> only a small difference between the maximum number of electrons we can acquire and uh, or we can basically generate and the minimum, then we have a low dynamic range, but we also have six steps. Okay, so in both of them, we have six steps. So we have the same bit depth and we have um, high and low dynamic range. And now if we do the opposite and we say we're going to keep the same dynamic range, so the same difference between the minimum and the maximum, now we're going to put lots of steps instead of having the same number of steps. So here we have a high and low bit depth and uh, the same dynamic range, the minimum, the difference between the minimum and, and the maximum. Okay, so these steps here represent the uh, number of possible intensity values that we have in an image. So it can be here, the first one would be zero, and then maybe it goes to 4,095. So it's the number of steps, basically. Sylvie, so if, Sylvie, yeah, sorry, yep, sorry yep. to interrupt. Can you go no, to no. the previous slide? Yeah. Uh, so this might seem a bit attention to detail, but you don't no. have six steps on the low dynamic range one. You have only five. One, two, three. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, that's, that's all for the future. <laughs> yes, exactly. You know, it's good to have room for improvement every year. <laughs> so very good. good. Well spotted. <laughs> so just forget the previous slide. And here, um, you can uh, see, for example, an image uh, that shows all the different gray levels that we can have on an 8-bit image, and I will uh, explain a little bit more. So we have uh, completely black and completely white and lots of steps in between. So what does that mean, 8 bits? 8 bits means 2 to the power of 8 uh, levels of gray in the image. So if you do this calculation to, to the power of eight, you get 256. And therefore we have 256 different intensity values, or they're also called gray levels. Okay. So in our image, we could have 256 shades. And uh, the, um, the lowest intensity is always zero. So that is represented by completely black. And the highest, <clears throat> the highest intensity is this one counts at the first one. So if I have 256 levels, the last one is 255. And that is represented as completely white. And anything that is in between has an intermediary um, uh, uh, gray level and uh, it is gray. So this is an image uh, representing all the, uh, all the different gray levels that you can have now in a 16-bit image. And so 16 bit is two to the power of 16. And that is this big number, 65,000 plus, plus, plus. And uh, so 65,000 gray levels. And with the first one being zero and the last one being 65,535. Okay, so one less. So the first, the, the, the zero actually always counts as the level number one. So this is what, um, what does that mean? In uh, just like, what does that mean in here? Is that when we uh, when we use a, a sixteen bit image, we can represent all the fine variation of intensity much better in our image because we have all these gray levels. Uh, the computer screens can only display eight bits, so only two hundred fifty six gray levels, and our human eyes are much worse, so we can only uh, see seven bits, or about a uh, hundred to one hundred fifty, I think, uh, uh, gray levels. So of course uh, we have all these gray levels. It's not for our eyes only; it's really for the computer to analyze. And uh, uh, we, uh, the computer can extract a lot of information in here, even if we cannot see it with our eyes. So we're going to go to quiz one. And uh, here we are. So we go to uh, Canvas and we click on quiz one. <clears throat> OK, so the first question is, how many levels of gray can uh, an 11 bit image have? Today, my mouse is not working very well. So 11-bit image, how many levels of gray? Two to the 11. Yes. Power. How much is that? Uh, 2,048. Is everybody um, happy with that answer? 
2048 we have anybody else want a bit higher <laughs> so is everybody understands this uh i think it is uh uh it's a little bit uh, simple it's basically a calculation whatever bit depth we are talking about this is what we are have uh, two to the power of that bit depth okay so two to the power of 11 is <clears throat> 2048 we move on to the next question what is the minimum possible intensive value in an 11 bit image so what is the lowest value we could find in an 11 bit image? Zero. Zero. So in all images, zero is the minimum. We can never get negative values, right? So zero is always the minimum. It doesn't matter which bit depth we're talking about. It's always going to be the, the minimum possible is always going to be zero. And what is the maximum possible intensity value in an 11 bit image? 2.47. 2047, right? I guess that's what you meant. 2047, right? The, when you do uh, 2 to the power of 11, you get 2048 uh, levels of gray. And so minus this, you're right. This is what you meant? Yes. Yes. Good. Everybody agrees with that. So this is the highest possible. And <clears throat> binary images are used a lot in image analysis and uh, they have only one bit. So what does the image look like? Black and white. Black and white. So how many levels of gray is one bit? It is one like to the po power two. of two. Two to, exactly. So two to the power of one is two. And therefore they have only two level two levels possible. And we say the uh, the minimum is always uh, completely black. And uh, and so and the maximum is two minus one, basically. So it's going to be completely black or completely white. So this is the correct answer. There is no gray level in a bi binary image. Every single pixel is either black or white. This is why it's called binary, because it has only two possible values. Well done, and uh, I think it maybe, I don't know, somehow the second question, there's a bug in there. It tells you that you didn't answer. But anyway, you have the uh, explanations here uh, underneath, uh, if, you, if you want to read that. Well done. So I move on to my next slide. So these are the different bit depths that we have. So for example, eight bits, we could also have 11 bits. We could also have 14 bits. So depending on the type of camera you have, you can have also, I mean, in general, eight, 11, 12, 14, 16. This is what you uh, find um, on uh, both sensors and, uh, and I mean, all sensors basically. So the number of gray is in here. Here you recognize now 4096. And so you remember that uh, so the minimum is zero and this is the maximum. And you remember in the first image I showed you, all the red pixels that were saturated had the value of 4095. And this means it was a 12 bit image. So uh, that was really the maximum. So what happens is that these eight bit images, they can be opened by any software. You know, you can insert them in PowerPoint presentations and everything, but everything that has a bit depth higher than uh, eight uh, requires a little bit specialized software. So you can open them with Fiji anyway. You can also open them with like Photoshop, for example, but you will not be able to, uh, if you double click on an image that is higher than 12 bits, it's either it does not open or it will look completely, completely black and you will not see anything in the image. Um, and um, so you can, uh, you can use them with specialized software, like for example, the microscope software or Fiji uh, or, or Photoshop can also open this. And so if you want <clears throat> to uh, insert uh, an image that has been acquired at a high bit depth in a PowerPoint presentation, you first need to downgrade it and I will show you how to do that. You need to basically uh, make it as an 8-bit image so that you, uh, you can insert it. So ideally, one would want the highest possible dynamic range of the sensor, right? So that we can image whatever we want. And also enough bit depth 
to match that. And what I mean is this, if we have a dynamic range, a sensor with a dynamic range of 4,000 to one, so one is the minimum number of electrons that can be generated uh, in the, um, uh, without any incoming light, just the noise, and the 4,000 is the maximum before it starts saturating. So we have this type of, uh, of sensor with this dynamic range, then we would want to use 12-bit. Uh, we want to convert uh, this voltage to 12-bit uh, images so that we have 4,096 levels of gray. So basically the uh, bit depth should be just above the dynamic range. That's the ideal situation, but it's not always <clears throat> uh, the best uh, solution. So I show you now why. So the advantage of having a high dynamic range and a high bit depth are you get all the fine intensity details in both the bright and dim areas. You have a lower risk for saturation if you have a high uh, dynamic range. So even with very bright sample, you're not going to saturate. And the um, the five size the file size everything except eight bits has the same size. So basically eight bit has one size. This is because of the way computers are make, made that they only uh, deal with eight uh, blocks at the same time. So they can only read eight or 16. So if you acquire in eight, it's going to stay as eight, but if you acquire 11, 12, 14, or 16, it's anyway going to convert it into 16. So it means that we have only two sizes Either it's eight or it's double. And uh, <clears throat> so 11, uh, 12, 14 bit, uh, 16 bit images, they have all, they have the same size and they are double the size of an eight bit image. So we get um, <clears throat> bigger file size basically. Um, and then the better, uh, uh, we get a better edge definition when, uh, when we have a high uh, bit depth and a high dynamic range, the definition is, uh, when we have a high bit depth, sorry, we get a very nice definition of all the edges. And that will help in segmenting crowding, crowded objects. So again, I remind you what I mean by segmentation. In this image I've shown you at the beginning, if we're interested only in the, the uh, dots and we are not interested in the, in the cloudy uh, uh, signal that we have, we will create in, this is one of the steps. So the most demanding step in image analysis is to create this segmentation mask that will indicate to the software, which are the areas of interest. And then the background is black, okay? The place that we, the signal is in white and the background is in black. And therefore, when we extract from this, um, when we apply this mask to our image, we make a segmented image, we only extract the information in the areas that we're interested in. So this is called segmentation. <clears throat> and <clears throat> having uh, fine edges, having well-defined edges of the uh, objects helps a lot in segmenting the image, especially when the objects are very crowded. So uh, it is an advantage to use a high bit, um, a high bit depth uh, when you're acquiring images of small objects crowded and you want to segment the image. So why would not anyone want to use the high bit depth in that case because there's so such nice advantages. Well, it can be several reasons. Uh, one of them is maybe I don't need all these fine details. Maybe I'm counting uh, cells uh, with nuclei and they are quite well separated. So they're very easy to segment and I don't need to the edges to be uh, very well defined. So maybe I don't need it. And also maybe my sample is very dim everywhere. So I don't have any risk of saturating the, uh, the sensor and therefore maybe I don't need such a high bit depth and a high dynamic range. The speed is an issue. Uh, actually, when you acquire with high bit depth, you go slower. And that is because there's a lot more information that has to be transferred uh, you know, during the conversion and then processed uh, uh, to produce the image and therefore the acquisition is slower. So uh, for the sake of speed, definitely uh, you might not want to go for the higher bit depth. Saving space as well, because as I said, I, uh, eight images has, uh, if I take two images, one in <clears throat> the same 
sample and everything. I take one in 8-bit and then I change and I go to 16-bit. The 16-bit image is going to be, uh, or, or to any of these bit depth, these images are going to be double the size compared to the 8 bits. So if I have a lot, if I acquire a lot of images, uh, it's better to, to pick the uh, lower bit depth. And if you acquire a lot of images, it means it's going to be very demanding for the analysis computer. And therefore, uh, if you can, go for 8 bits as well. And then, of course, we have the advantage that if we have 8-bit images, we can display them uh, in a presentation uh, without having to convert them to 8-bits first. So that also gain a little bit of time. But basically, in the dream world, we'd want to have the highest uh, <clears throat> possible dynamic range and bit depth. But in reality, there are some reasons why uh, we might uh, choose a lower bit depth. And again, the bit depth is something that you choose when you acquire the image. So you have to sort of... Uh, get an idea before um, <clears throat> you press the acquire button what you want to do with the image. So this is an example of the specification sheet of a uh, camera. So this is an SCMOS in a front illuminated SCMOS camera by uh, Andor, it's called Zyla. So there are two different types of Zylas. And uh, I show you the spec sheet. This is something that you can get online for your own um, uh, camera, and you will, because this is one of the assignments, you have to go and get this information. So I show you an example here. On this spec sheet, you can see here the maximum quantum efficiency, uh, which is 82%. And why do they say maximum quantum efficiency? Um, does anyone know why it would be the maximum? Does that mean it can go lower than that? Yeah, it depends on the wavelength. Exactly. So we have seen this morning that the um, the quantum efficiency is actually a curve and it's not exactly flat at the top. Uh, so uh, it goes up and down depending on the wavelengths. Usually the maximum is around uh, the sort of green orange wavelengths. And so that is, the, they are showing the, the top basically of this curve. Well done. And here we have the pixel readout rate. So it's talking about the readout rate, which is uh, how fast we empty. So we accumulate, accumulate uh, electrons during these milliseconds of exposure time. And then that's it. The exposure is finished. We empty the chip completely. And that is the readout. And how fast we empty the chip uh, is, uh, is a choice that you make in the software. So in Xyla, you can choose between 216 or 400, uh, 540 uh, megahertz. And uh, <clears throat> if you choose the fastest readout rate, you get more noise. OK, so you can see, <clears throat> I think they also show it somewhere else. Uh, right, in here, you can see the read noise. So uh, the, the read noise is higher. This is the number of electrons. So uh, the read noise is higher when we, um, when we empty the chip very fast. So the higher the readout and the more the noise. And therefore, our dynamic range decreases. <clears throat> so this is the pixel well depth. So this is, uh, as I was saying, the highest level of the dynamic range. So here uh, we have the uh, 30,000 is in this uh, camera. And therefore, they have calculated the maximum dynamic range and uh, 30,000 is fixed. Uh, but because the, uh, the read noise changes depending on the settings, they have calculated with the lowest read noise and calculated this 33,000 uh, column one. So this is an example of how you get all this information uh, from your camera. You can go online and find the specifications. If you cannot find the specifications, just write to the company. They have to give them to you. But normally, uh, you, uh, when you get to camera, you also get this on, on paper and you can find them online. Oh, yeah. And I forgot this one. You can also choose in this camera. You can choose if you're going to acquire in 12 bits or 16 bits. And in 16-bit, they write here that you have the maximum dynamic range, whereas in 12-bits, you go fastest. This is an example of changing the bit depth in the Zen software on the single point confocal. A lot of people have uh, never even seen this, even though it's always there. So uh, I just want to mention that here in the scan area, you can get the pixel size. So uh, later we will use this pixel size a lot. And we have spoken a little bit about the speed of acquisition uh, this morning. And this is the place where you can change from monodirectional, which is this to bidirectional. And if you have a pixel misalignment, 
it's in here that you can find it as well by, uh, I think it's clicking on here or something. When you go bidirectional, you get the, like something that allows you to align the two lines together. And if you click on here, you have the choice between eight bits or 16 bits. So please uh, think about it. What is it that you are, um, um, that you are imaging? and choose eight bits if, if uh, you have samples that are, do not require uh, a lot of uh, bits and you don't have uh, really a very wide uh, range of intensities in your uh, image and in your sample. But if you have very bright and very dim areas, you should go to 16 bits to use the full dynamic range of the sensor. So, <clears throat> Once we have acquired the images, if we have acquired in high bit depth and we want to um, we want to to put these images in a PowerPoint presentation, we can completely downgrade the image. Uh, so you can go to Fiji and then here under image type and you can click to the 8 bit to make this image as an 8 bit, then you will be able to insert it in a PowerPoint presentation. And when you analyze the images, uh, as I said, uh, high bit depth images are heavier to analyze. So uh, you can also uh, downgrade them if your computer is uh, straining to, to analyze them. But you should always do this on a copy of the original and always keep the original intact. This is really, really important. Keep the original. As I said, an image is not just uh, a collection of uh, X, Y, intensity, uh, X, Y uh, positions and intensity in each pixel. It's also metadata. And you do not want to lose the metadata, which is all the information of how you have acquired. So it's extremely important to keep the original uh, image intact and only work on a copy of an image. And then you can change from a uh, changing from a low bit depth to a high bit depth is never useful because you're not going to uh, to acquire. I mean, you're not going to create any data anyway, so there is no point uh, in doing this. So uh, only go from high to low, but not low to high. Okay, so now we're going to go to another quiz. And here, there it is. Preview. <clears throat> okay, so here I have six images. It's a little bit difficult, but you can see in your own quiz. Um, so I can clearly see a difference uh, uh, between this image and that image, for example. I hope that you can see uh, a difference between these four images. This is a binary image, by the way. So it has only two gray levels. It means the pixels are either black or white. This is what uh, mask segmentation masks uh, can look like. So we see a difference between these four images, but as we go to higher bit depth, we know there's no difference. So we cannot see any difference here. Why is that? Maybe um, it should be that we should always acquire an ABIT because anyway, there's no difference. What did you say? Someone said something. Yeah. Um, to ask an answer to the question, because the human eye cannot see more levels of gray. Exactly. So not only the human eye cannot see more levels of gray, but also the computer screen cannot display more than 256. So it means that all these images are going to look the same, but the reality is that they are not the same. And when we analyze these images there, we're going to see a difference, okay? So that is the answer. The uh, computer screen and the human eye do not see enough gray levels to see the fine uh, detail, the differences. Um, <clears throat> Uh, so in a high bit depth. Is it okay with everyone? What the next question? So now, now you have to think about a little bit. So um, my favorite microscope is a single point code focal from Zeiss. The dynamic range of the detector the detectors, because we have several detectors, is 4,000 to one. And their quantum efficiency is 50%, which is very high for uh, detectors. So the Zen software acquires images uh, at eight bits by default. However, there is an option in the software to acquire at 16 bits. 
Now I have some questions about this. How many photons uh, need to reach the detector to statistically trigger one electron charge inside the detector? So these are the possible answers. Two. Two. Well done. That was quick. <laughs> Is it, everybody's okay with that? Can you can you explain? Because the Why quantum two? efficiency is 50%, so you need two photons to trigger one electron. Okay, very good. So it means if we have 10 photons coming to the detector, statistically only five will be detected. So if we want to know uh, the very minimum that we uh, need is one, but is two. But of course it is statistical, right? So it is possible that several electron comes in, uh, photons come in and they trigger. So it is a statistic thing. So 50% quantum efficiency means that half of the incoming photons <clears throat> statistically uh, will be uh, triggering a charge inside. So if we have two, we get the chance to have one. What is the readout noise of the detector? These are the possible answers. Maybe someone else. What do you think, the others who haven't spoken so far? I'm challenging you. Anyone knows? How do we know the readout noise of our detector? It is written somewhere here. Huh? I am not, uh, obviously I have written it somewhere, otherwise I wouldn't ask you. So what is the readout noise in this? One. Sorry. Sorry? Someone said uh, one? Okay. Uh, I think 0 0.5 maybe. 0 0.5? Okay, I would say one because uh, this is the lower limit of the dynamic range. Right, so we're talking about this. This is the dynamic range. And I said the dynamic range, uh, uh, in the dynamic range, the lower number is the readout noise, which means it's the, the electron, the number of electron that is uh, generated inside the uh, sensor when there is no light at all. So this is the readout noise and it's one. It means whatever, even if we don't have any light, somehow we will get one electron uh, generated inside our sensor. Okay, so this is the um, the readout noise of the uh, detector of the sensor, and this is way before. You remember when I showed you what happens? So I have a few photons come in. Only less than them will uh, uh, trigger actually an electron charge. This is the quantum efficiency. So that's the very beginning of the process where uh, the photons are coming into the detector and only a few of them are detected. So this is what the 50% the is. And the dynamic range here refers to the very last step really of this after the amplification. And then we, we try to, we, we convert the signal. So the minimum signal we get is the readout noise and it's one, okay? So the correct answer is one. Good, and then what is the lowest number of electrons that will saturate the sensor? Here is your possible answers. This is important to read the question carefully to weigh all the words. Four thousand and one. Four thousand and one. 
So someone, can someone explain why? Say someone who agrees, who would, uh, who would be able to explain? Um, the upper value of the dynamic range is the um, last value where the it, it's not saturated yet. So the next one more electron would saturate it. Exactly. So yeah. Exactly. So this is the maximum number of electrons that do not saturate the sensor. And therefore, 4001, that's it. It would be saturated. OK, is everybody OK with that? You tell me if you have any questions, okay? So I first acquire images for an experiment where all the samples are expected to be very dim. Which bit depth is the most appropriate for this experiment? Eight, 16, or there is no difference? Eight. So any explanation? Because you are not um, looking at a very bright and a very dim signal you know, in the same figure, so it doesn't really matter that the APS will just go faster with imaging. Exactly. So if we go to uh, to eight bits, anyway, we have no risk of saturating, so it's okay with only eight bits, and uh, then we will go faster, and our file size will be smaller, and it means it will be also easier to analyze because the uh, the files will not be so big. And later, I have another experiment with live samples, and at the start, my sample uh, my samples are not fluorescent, but I expect the fluorescence to grow over time to quite bright, and uh, and this increase this is this increase that I want to measure. So in that case, sixteen bits, so that you would have lower risk of saturations later, since you don't know how bright it will be. Exactly. And in this particular case, when you, uh, when you image such a sample, uh, you have to go a little bit blind at the beginning, right? Because you don't know actually how bright the thing is going to be. So uh, at the start, you have to go a little bit blind and likely you will have to uh, renew the experiment because the, it, it is likely that you're going to saturate on the first, you know, you're going to put your illumination power or your uh, exposure time too long and then you will likely saturate or maybe it will be too dim altogether and you haven't put it off. So you have to go a little bit blind at the beginning, but it's always good uh, to use 16 bits to start with because you expect it to go higher anyway. So very well done. And I don't know why it tells me that I haven't answered everything because I have, but uh, so now, yeah, because I, I just said nothing actually on the first, uh, on the first answer, but you have uh, the explanations in here uh, if you want uh, to read uh, later. <clears throat> okay. So uh, yes, again, always change on a uh, copy of the original if you change. And uh, yeah, I think I've said that before. So now, which, which settings would you choose? The ideal dynamic range should be as high as possible, but it depends on the sensor specification. And uh, increasing the readout rate decreases the uh, dynamic range because you get a higher noise. Uh, however, you can go faster. Uh, the ideal bit depth maximum should be uh, higher than the dynamic range. Uh, so as I said, if you have 4,000 to one, you would use a 12-bit image because uh, the bit depth goes all the way to 4,096. So it's higher than the highest level of your dynamic range. Uh, but unfortunately, sometimes you have to not use the full dynamic range, and that is because you want to image faster, so you have to choose lower bit depth, or maybe you want to reduce the file size, then you have to use 8-bit. And if you want to run, uh, if you have heavy uh, computing uh, with your images to analyze, then maybe the lower bit depth can be an option. And if your sample is very dim, there is no need to have a very high bit depth. Uh, if it is hard to image without saturation, then you increase the bit depth to use the full dynamic range of the sensor. So for example, another example of uh, uh, when you need to use the bit depth, if, if you use a multi-well plate and in the different wells, you have uh, lots of different uh, um, intensities. So it's, it's not only if you have bright and dim in the same image or over time, it can be also in different wells, for example. But the images that you want to compare have to have the same bit depth. 
And if you want to insert it in a presentation, you'll have to convert and always do this on a copy. And so it is very important. I think you understand now this idea of uh, dynamic range and bit depth. It is important that you think about what you, again, what you want to get from images and you match your settings for your requirements for your experiment okay this is really what i want uh, you to do over uh, all this course is that you think about what you need to do and you match the settings for this it's not just a random thing that we pick eight bits or 12 bits it makes a difference okay so now i'm going to talk about uh, the second point which is how to detect saturation and underexposure in an image and there i will talk about lookup tables and histograms so this is this image again, uh, which is saturated. Uh, this channel is saturated. Uh, as I said before, um, most sensors that we use acquire images in black and white. All the detectors acquire images in black and white. But um, <clears throat> so I just want to mention here that maybe it's a little bit unclear. When we have a spectral detector, we uh, the emission light right which is a mix of all sorts of color the emission light comes out of the sample and it is split in the rainbow and in front of this rainbow we put all sorts of detectors right each of these detector is going to get a certain part of the rainbow so maybe 10 nanometers you can change the setting actually so and that corresponds to a color but each detector anyway acquires the images in black and white so the uh, one detector is going to get only uh, uh, wh whatever 460 to 470 nanometer uh, light, but it acquires these photons uh, in black and white, okay? So it's, it's a little bit uh, fiddly to think about, but uh, it gets a very narrow range of wavelengths, but it does acquire the images in black and white. So all detectors in single point confocals acquire images in black and white, and most cameras, uh, at least the most sensitive ones, because the black the color images are not the, the color cameras are not so sensitive so we have um different ways to see these images so look up tables so it's a, a bit strange uh, uh word but i think it comes from computing uh, the computing industry uh, they're called lookup tables or lut these are a tool to help us see the image the way we would like to see it. So, you know, to make an impression on our brain. And they can be, for example, artificial color. So in this image, which is a black and white image, I can say that is going to be green. And I put an artificial color that is a lookup table. So I'm, I'm applying a lookup table to this image, a green lookup table. So it could be an artificial color. It could be also if I have a Z stack. Uh, that I want to uh, color code uh, different things. Uh, so I want to apply color coding in the Z or in the intensity. And it could be also that I want to change the brightness and the contrast in the image. All these things are lookup tables and they are a uh, computer tool to help us see the image. The data is not changed. It's only the way the data is displayed that is modified, but the data is the same, okay? So um, the saturation and underexposure lookup table is the one that I have shown you before, where we see red and blue. It's available in all software. So in here, we can see all the, uh, all the um, pixels that have the maximum bit depth, that have an intensity at the maximum bit depth. So if we have a 12-bit image, the maximum intensity is 4,095 and the minimum is zero. So 4,095, all the pixels that have an intensity of 4,095 are going to be represented in red. This is the saturation and underexposure lookup tables. And they have a different name in different software, but it's basically all the same. So you can, in all software, you have some button somewhere where you can apply this lookup table so that you can easily identify which pixels are saturated. So in the Nikon software, we click on this little button here, and this is what it does. It, what it does is that it removes, if you had another lookup table, like for example, if you had this color, this channel, you had it in color, it would remove the lookup table, the channel, uh, the color uh, lookup table, 
and it would uh, uh, color code the saturated pixels, so those that have a maximum uh, the intensity at the maximum bit depth, it will color code them in one color. And all the uh, pixels that have an intensity of zero, it will color code them in another color. So it's like warning lookup table. And in general, uh, you have somewhere in the software, you can change these colors as you want. So it doesn't have to be blue and red, but it's often blue and red. In some software, you, so it's a little bit, I just say it like this as a warning, but in, soft, in some software, you first need to reset the brightness and contrast to actually see the saturation and the underexposure. And this is the case in Zen and in Fiji, unfortunately. Anyway, in Zen, this lookup table, uh, saturation and underexposure lookup table is called the range indicator. So I'm sure that some people have seen that. And in Fiji, it is called high-low. So when you find it here and you have this little LUT button on Fiji, if you click on that, you can, you see, color code your image in all sorts of different ways. You can apply all these lookup tables. So does anyone use the range indicator when acquiring on the Zen uh, system? Yes. Good, so you know where to find it. And it is quite useful. Does anyone not use the range indicator acquiring on the Zen system, but you don't use it? Or someone doesn't like it, and so they don't use it. It's okay, huh? you can say. <laughs> and I would like to know if anyone um, knows what this is called in the Leica software or in the Olympus software because I actually do not know when these buttons are called. Do you know? I think there are a couple of people using Leica systems, right? So the Leica, Leica people, do you, have you ever used uh, the uh, saturation and underexposure uh, lookup tables then? Anyone using Leica? Yes? <laughs> what is the name of the, uh, okay. Someone in the chat says yes, but I have not used them. Anybody knows the name in maybe in the attendees, maybe someone knows the name of the Leica lookup tables. If you know, you can put it in the chat. But basically what happens is that a lot of people do not know that this is there. And um, and they uh, and if they know that it's there, they find it annoying. And I will tell you why <laughs> you should have it on all the time. Okay, so oop. so the lookup tables, uh, you know, is, this is a typical conversation that we have at the facility. When shall I check for saturation and underexposure? Always, you should always check. You should never have any saturation and underexposure in your image, full stop. So it means that this saturation and underexposure lookup table, you should have it on all the time when you image. So some people would say, well, that is very annoying because you know my channel is green and so I want to see it in green. Well, that is not a very good idea because our eyes see green much better than the other colors. And so the other colors will always look dimmer. So you have a complete color bias when you look at, a, uh, at an image in green or, or in blue or in red, whereas uh, you could look them as they actually are, which means they are black and white images. So you should look at them in black and white images and that way you can actually uh, judge the colors and the brightness much better. So look at black and white. Okay, now we have, some, uh, there is in the Leica software something called lookup table. Okay, in Leica it's lookup table. <laughs> Good, thank you. Uh, so in, um, it, it is very important to keep the lookup table uh, on all the time. And uh, so look at the images in black and white. It's the same thing that I was saying. If you want to display images in a presentation, it is much better to have the individual channels in black and white, and then the overlay in color. This way you get, you know, the best of all words, but people can actually judge the different channels in an equal way. Uh, otherwise there is a strong uh, green bias when we look at things in color. Uh, 
So, uh, and then some people say, well, well, you know, I get all these uh, extra red and extra blue there in my image. I cannot see my signal. Well, I'm sorry, but if you have some blue and red, it means your images are badly acquired. So do something about it, change your settings and reacquire the image until you have no blue and red. Okay, if the acquisition settings were correct, there would be no blue and red in the image. So just get your act together and change the settings and reacquire the image. Always leave the lookup table on and acquire the images so that the blue and the red does not bother you because there is no blue and the red and then I will be happy. So the other way to check if we have some um, uh, some uh, saturation or underexposure, it's to look at the histogram. So that is another way to uh, look at the health of our image. Basically, we look at the histogram. So I mean, in, in the Nikon software, so again, this is available in all software. And in the Nikon software, you can you have something called a histogram. And basically, you can see in here, uh, in this histogram, though, here we have the number of pixels at a certain intensity. So, so for example, in the green channel, we, we have about, I don't know, maybe 160 pixels that have an intensity of 1000. This, this is the way to read this histogram. And because we have a 12-bit image, so now we know what that means, uh, the, the histogram starts at zero and it ends at 4095, which is the maximum at that bit depth. And when we look here, uh, we can sort of see how many pixels we have at each intensity. So if we check what we have at zero intensity, now we can see the problem. At intensity zero, we have a lot of blue pixels that have the uh, intensity zero and also a lot of red pixels, but we have no uh, green pixels with the intensity zero. It means that the green pixels is, uh, the green uh, channel has no underexposure, but the blue and the red channel has have a lot of underexposure. And we can do the same thing here in the saturated pixels. We can see that the green channel is heavily uh, saturated, uh, we have uh, almost 4,500 pixels that are saturated, but uh, whereas there's no saturation in the blue and the green image. And you can see very clearly anyway, just by looking at it, that uh, in the, uh, the red and the blue um, uh, spectra, let's say not spectra, sorry, uh, the red and the blue uh, histogram, you can see that uh, it is completely shifted towards the low intensities, whereas the green one takes uh, really the full, uh, the full uh, bit depth, actually, it goes too high in here. But basically, the green image will uh, cover uh, the full dynamic range. And so it's, uh, we're going to talk later about how to avoid saturation and underexposure, not have images like this that are saturated and underexposed. And uh, this is uh, when we talk about the typical workflow of how to set a single point code focal. We're going to go through all the different type of settings that you can change to avoid this problem. And so now this is an image that has been acquired again and that is uh, properly uh, exposed. And, uh, and you can see that uh, uh, we uh, we have zero pixels under exposed and zero pixels saturated. So now we are happy. No saturation at all and no underexposure at all in the area of interest. This is what you must have all the time. And this is true for cameras and this is true for, uh, for detectors, right? So uh, one uh, thing to remember also is that the maximum bit depth is not the maximum intensity in the image. It is the maximum possible intensity, but the actual intensity in the image, in this image, you have no zero pixels, no pixels with zero, uh, an intensity of zero, and you have no, uh, no pixels with an intensity, a uh, very high intensity either, because now there's no more saturation and no more underexposure. So the bit depth is that the 4096 levels of gray is really what, is possible in the image, but it doesn't mean that it is the intensity that we have in the image. I hope it's uh, it's clear. And if the image is not saturated, uh, the maximum intensity in the image should be below the bit depth. This is why we have no pixels at all that have the intensity of 4095. So in Fiji, you can find the histogram in here under analyze histogram. And so when we click on that, we're getting the histogram for each of these channels. Here it shows you the maximum uh, in this uh, minimum and the maximum in this image. 
And um, yes, okay. Now I am going to talk about what the consequences of saturation and underexposure are. And basically we have no usable information in the image. So it is a very important thing to uh, think about. So what are the consequences of saturation? So now we are acquiring um, a fluorescent bead, an image of a fluorescent bead with a spectral detector. So you remember what Gabi said this morning, the emission light comes in. We have we are on a single point confocal, right? Only single point confocals can do a spectral detection. So we have this uh, emission light that comes in. We have no emission filters. Instead, the light is split by a prism or by a grid. It's split into a rainbow, and there in front of the rainbow, we put a lot of detectors, different numbers depending on which company, but basically many detectors. And each detector gets a little bit of the rainbow. And therefore, in a Nikon system, we have 32 channels. And so when we take a spectral image, we have this extra dimension, right? Not only uh, X, Y and intensity, but we have actually 32 different intensities. Uh, so 32 different images uh, for just one acquisition. And what we can see in here, this is only one bead, right? It's 32 different channels for the same bead. But if you look a little bit, you can see that this bead looks bigger than that one. So how can that be possible? All the images of the same bead uh, should all have the same size. But now if we look at the saturation, if we turn on the saturation lookup table, we can see that some of these channels are saturated. So that is a consequence of saturation. It, uh, the, chi the, the size is, uh, is uh, the apparent size is, is wrong. So the saturated objects will appear artificially larger. And it means not only you get the wrong intensity, but you also get the wrong size. So you can see on top of that, when the object start looking bigger, if they are close to each other, they are going to fuse. So if you count these uh, number, uh, the number of cells in here, you will get less cells because they will look fused. And so it will look like one object instead of two. OK, so always keep the saturation and underexposure lookup table on and set the imaging parameters to have absolutely no saturation. It is very important and it doesn't matter what your eyes see. I will show you how to display the images so that you can actually see the information. It doesn't matter what your eyes see. What matter is what the information that is in the image. Our eyes are not very good, so you should not trust your eyes. So now we're going to look at the consequences of underexposure. It's a little bit similar. So in here, we have a very uh, heavily underexposed background. All these pixels basically have an intensity of zero. We have turned on the uh, saturation and underexposure lookup table. So everything that is at intensity zero is color coded in blue. And when we draw a line here and we do an intensity profile through these beads, this is what we can see. So the real edge of the bead. So you can see the edge is anywhere a little bit soft, so it's difficult to know where it is. But if we uh, look at the profile, we can say, for example, maybe the edge is here, that it starts going up. But in here, it looks much smaller. So it's a little bit difficult here to, uh, to, to see that because our eyes are not so good. And that looks so much more contrasted because of the blue. Our eyes would not be able to detect the fact that this bead is actually smaller than this one. But when you look at uh, the intensity profile, you clearly see that this is the case, okay? <clears throat> so again, not only we are losing all the details at the edges, but on top of that, we have the wrong size. And this is a, uh, an image or two images. Uh, and uh, uh, this one has a little bit of uh, uh, underexposure in the image. And that may be accepted by a journal. This one will very likely be rejected by a journal. It's extremely painful when you want to publish your results. And you have acquired these images six months before, or maybe even longer. And you don't have the samples anymore. And uh, your image is rejected. And they say, can you please do it again? These images are under exposed. So just avoid it from the start, okay? So keep this saturation and underexposure lookup table at, on at all time and set the imaging parameters to have no underexposure at all. So now I have uh, been to the course 
and I have listened to uh, so, to what uh, uh, I was told, and so I have acquired images, and there's no saturation, no underexposure. But in some of my images, I noticed that I have this gray background, and I would like to publish this, and it doesn't look really really nice. I'd love to have a dark background. Um, so. This can be fixed after acquisition, so it's not a problem. It is so much better for you to take an image with a gray background that you correct afterwards, that take an image uh, with no information in the background at all that is likely to be rejected. So how to fix the background after acquisition? Uh, so we have here uh, the saturation and uh, uh, under exposure lookup table is on. So we can see, because we see no blue and no red, uh, we can see that these uh, images are not saturated and not underexposed, okay? The exposure is therefore correct. There's no blue or no red. So um, we first we acquire the images without un under any underexposure on a single point of focal. And um, on a camera-based system, um, it is not possible to acquire underexposed uh, images. Why? because of this camera offset that the manufacturers have. It is, sorry, um, now I'm a bit confused if I said that before or not. I think I did, right? Uh, the manufacturers, uh, the, the camera uh, electronics cannot deal with, uh, with zero uh, numbers and therefore the manufacturer add this uh, 100 or 200 counts automatically. Therefore, it's not possible to take underexposed images with cameras, but you can do that very easily uh, even without knowing on a single point confocal. So be extra careful if you use a single point confocal. Uh, um, so what you can do in these images is that you can subtract the background and the background can be, as we saw this morning, it can be autofluorescence in the mounting medium. It could be the camera offset uh, from the fact, uh, manufacturer and this can be done after acquisition. Always uh, treat the control and the samples in the same way and always mention when you publish what you have done. So I have subtracted the background using Fiji, uh, whatever uh, plugin, okay? And uh, so you can, uh, you can uh, basically put the region of interest, depending on the software, you do it differently, but basically you could put a square in here and then say, remove all the minimum from this, uh, the whole image. So subtract the background after acquisition and uh, uh, that's it. And now uh, of the consequences of uh, saturation and underexposure, I'm sure that you now understand how important this is. The intensity information recorded in all saturated and all underexposed pixels is absolutely incorrect. The size of the saturated or underexposed object is likely to be incorrect. Depends how close to the edge the saturation and underexposing. So but it's likely to be incorrect. And therefore the number of objects when you count, uh, when you analyze saturated and underexposed pictures is likely to be incorrect. The intensity, uh, the correct intensity and size information cannot be recovered. Once you have acquired images like this, you can just throw them away. And these are likely to be rejected by journals. So don't believe your eyes. Keep this uh, lookup table on at all time when imaging and set your parameters to, uh, to have it not bother you. So no blue, no, uh, no red in the image. And always mention, uh, you can mention in the material method that these images, the parameters of the microscope were set to have no saturation, no underexposure in the image. And the reviewers will be very happy with you. And they will say, oh, these people, they know what they're talking about. So that is definitely the message, uh, no saturation, no underexposure anywhere. So now I'm going to tell you uh, how to actually uh, change or use the lookup tables to be able to see with your eyes the things that uh, you cannot see in the image. So we're going to talk about how to show, how to display bright and dim areas in an image. So brightness, contrast, and gamma. So again, we're talking about lookup tables. Uh, these are ways, uh, uh, tricks to in the software to help us see the image. And uh, it changes the way the computer displays the data, but the data is not modified, okay? So uh, it's available in all microscopy software. You just need to figure out in your software where it is. But basically this image looks very, very dim and it is possible to see all the details in there. It's just that our eyes can see it, but the information is in the image. So we just have to sort of display it in such a way that we can see it. 
So what we're talking about now is changing the brightness and the contrast. So in the, in the for example, I mean, I give the example of the Nikon software, but we have a little tab called uh, lookup tables. So the manual lookup tables, when you click on that, this is what you get. And you recognize here the uh, histogram. So it looks a little bit like a simplified histogram, basically. Uh, and um, for each channel, and this, this you can find uh, both at the top of the image, but also in this uh, tab. And uh, this, uh, the, uh, in, uh, in all software, you will find an automatic lookup table. And the automatic lookup table basically is like some buttons that you push and that can auto scale the image. So uh, different software call it differently, but it's basically doing the same thing. And you can have either it will auto scale just the image you're looking at. Uh, you can also keep the auto scale on all the time, which means that every time you acquire an image, it will be auto scaled automatically. So these are sort of two different uh, settings, but you, you have this certainly in your software. Sorry, I'm going backwards. And that is a way to toggle the stuff on and on. So on and on the display. And that one is just to reset everything. And all this can be found. Uh, you can also use the this uh, this one to do it manually. And uh, so you to do it manually, you basically in here, when you have clicked on this auto scale, what happens is that the software will automatically detect in the image what is the lowest intensity and it will uh, display nothing uh, uh, lower and what is the maximum intensity in the image. So in here somewhere, even though most our photons are here, most our uh, pixels have uh, 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 in an intensity around 180 or something like this, they are, there is at least one pixel that has an intensity of 1000. And you can see that we are at the level of the noise, but that is actually uh, the brightest pixel in this blue image is 1000. So because the computer screens can only display eight bits, what, when we click on this uh, automatic button, what happens is that the software detects the minimum and the maximum and stretches it. So it sets the zero, uh, on the screen to this, and then the 256 on this, and this is what it displays. And so it's just a display thing and it doesn't change the data, uh, but it allows you to see actually uh, the very dim image. It actually allows you to see the details in the very dim image. So this is uh, basically, uh, yeah, the maximum, this would be the maximum uh, brightest uh, pixel, but uh, the maximum bit depth is at 4,000. Uh, 95 because it's a 12 bit image. And uh, it, there is always, so this is at the level of the noise, basically the 1000, uh, the intensity 1000, this is very much at the level of the noise. So typically you can also move in all software, you can do that, you can move these uh, and, and mostly they all display things in the same way. So you can use these triangles to move the minimum and the maximum uh, that is displayed. Okay. So when we push the, um, push the contrast and brightness to see with your eyes, the dim details in the image. And this is very useful when you want to focus on an out of focus sample. You know, uh, we will show you this, um, uh, we will show you this. I have someone in the attendee, no, okay. Uh, so we will show you this, uh, technique to uh, acquire images um, uh, in the transmitted light, not to acquire images, sorry, to uh, focus on your sample using transmitted light so you don't bleach it. And then you do this in the eyepiece, right? And then you go to the microscope, you take an image, and very often it's completely black. And why is that? It is because the eyepiece do not have the same um, focus as the camera. So basically you acquire an image is slightly out of focus. And if the brightness and contrast have not been pushed, you will not see anything. So it's difficult for you to refocus because it's all black, right? So what you do is that you, uh, when the sample is slightly out of focus, you push the brightness and contrast automatically. And that allows you to refocus, to find your sample. You see it, it's out of focus, and, and then you can refocus. It's a very useful uh, tool. However, if I remove this, uh, if I cancel basically the brightness and contrast and display the whole data, this is what the image looks like. So one has to keep in mind that uh, this display here is only showing me a very tiny part of the data. 
And this is in reality what the image looks like. And therefore, you can clearly see when you do not have the brightness and contrast pushed that this image is heavily, um, it not, does not have enough light. And it's very important not to get tricked by the brightness and contrast. If you keep the brightness and contrast on and you never keep your eye on the histogram, you will not realize that your image is actually very dim and that you should change your settings. So don't get tricked by the brightness and contrast. When you are adjusting your parameters, you should either reset the brightness and contrast or keep an eye on the histogram. And if your sample is very dim and you cannot make it brighter, it is maybe likely that you need to go to an 8-bit instead of going to a 12-bit image. Okay, so uh, this is uh, something, and it, it might not be possible. It might be that your detector does not allow you to go to 12 to 8 bits. You have to make sure that your image is brighter than this. So don't get tricked by the brightness and contrast. It's a useful tool, but it can also trick you. So now in Fiji, how do we find that uh, image? Just brightness contrast. This shows up, you can click on auto and then uh, it's automatically uh, done. You have to be really careful in Fiji. If you press apply, it actually modifies the data. So I said normally brightness contrast, it doesn't modify the data, it just modifies the display. But if you click apply in Fiji, it does. So always work on a copy of the original image uh, in Fiji. And then always mention all the adjustments that you do in your articles. Okay, finally, I want to talk about, and I'm looking now at the, what time it is, <laughs> and uh, I see that, uh, let me see, da, 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 the saturation, I think I'm okay, yeah, all right, so um, I want to talk finally about the last little bit, which is the gamma, and uh, gamma is extremely useful, and uh, a lot of people do not know about it. So it is often displayed uh, in the same way in all software. So again, we have here the minimum and the maximum bit depth. And here we have the gamma, but it can be somewhere else. This value is not always here, but this is often there. So you often have a little triangle for minimum and maximum, a, a line in, in between, and then you can move this line by dragging this uh, ball up and down. Okay, so that is often uh, the way it's, the gamma is displayed. So the gamma is one. When the gamma is one, it is uh, basically uh, not modified. So one is sort of uh, the ground level. Um, <clears throat> so again, this is uh, in all software. So what is gamma? So it's also a lookup table. So it's a way to display the data and it doesn't change the data. So what you can see in here is that we have not modified the uh, brightness and contrast. So we have uh, the full uh, from zero to 4,095 and the gamma is one. And what happens in this image is that I have some areas that are bright and I can see some details, but I also have some dim areas and these are, uh, I don't see any details. So then I, um, I now uh, change the brightness and contrast and I keep the gamma at one, okay? So I'm going to change the, uh, this maximum here and bring it back a little bit more. And I'm only displaying part of the data now on my computer. And what I can see is great. Now I see a lot of details in the dim areas. Unfortunately, all the bright areas look saturated. They are not saturated because we know that we have no uh, no pixel that has the intensity of 4095. So if you put your mouse above these pixels, you will still, still see the original intensity 2039, whatever, anything lower than 4095. But the display, it looks like these uh, areas are solid white. And uh, so it's not uh, good. You lose all the details in these areas when you only push uh, the brightness. So instead, we are now keeping the, well, we have modified a little bit the black, but basically we are keeping the maximum of the bit depth. We don't change the bit depth, but we now change the gamma. And so we drag this little ball a little bit up or down and the gamma value is changed. And what happens is that you can see this curve, it's a little bit difficult to see, but the curve is bent. And whereas this is a straight line, and now we, we look at the bright areas and the dim areas, both of them are, uh, we have the details in both of them. So the brightness and contrast affects all the pixels equally, okay? We increase everything or decrease everything. 
exactly in the same way. It's a linear adjustment. Whereas the gamma, in the gamma, when you change gamma, you affect either the bright pixels or the dim pixels. So you do not affect the bright and the dim pixels in the same way. This is nonlinear. So it's a nonlinear adjustment. And the lookup tables is, in this case, is adjusted only for the dim pixels and the bright pixels are unchanged. So if I would look here in this area, I can see that I have exactly the same image. It looks exactly the same as this. However, everything that was dim is here has been revealed. So gamma is extremely useful for you to display uh, an image where you have some bright and some dim areas where our eyes are not good enough to, uh, to, to grasp the small differences. Of course, all these must be uh, reported in articles. I have adjusted the, the gamma, the contrast, blah, blah, blah. You just say it and, and you're fine. So you have to report because you can imagine that we are changing the perception that we have of this image. In here, it looks like we don't have so much difference. So it is very important to uh, explain that you have uh, changed the gamma. So now that we have this, uh, this tool in our pocket, the gamma, I can show you the consequences of underexposure. Again, we have this image where this is heavily underexposed. All these blue pixels are in, uh, at zero intensity value. And it is when we do not have uh, the blue, it's very difficult to see that it has been underexposed. And so this would be the same image without the underexposure. But now, using the gamma, we can see all the details in the dim areas of the image. So when I change the gamma, what I can see is that everything here stays black. Why? Because this is zero. So I cannot add any information here. Whereas in here, when I change the gamma, I am actually revealing the dim information, which is in the image, only when, it's, uh, when the gamma is not pushed, I don't see it. So I don't see any difference in this, but there is a big difference. There's a lot of information in the background, in the dim areas that I have acquired, whereas in here, I have not acquired it because I have underexposed. And when I look, when I push the gamma, I can now see a lot of very fine uh, details of all the phylopodia and everything, all the fine details of the edges of the cell that are completely lost in this image because in here I acquired it with uh, underexposure. So in the underexposed image, we have no fine intensity details at the cell edges and it is not recoverable. Uh, in Fiji, uh, how to find gamma, it's under process, math and gamma. So you can play with your images, you'll get something like this. You can move the gamma and then uh, with the preview button, you can see uh, what you want to see. So in Fiji, again, always work on a copy of the original because it's very easy to modify the original without knowing. All right, so we have uh, contrast, brightness and uh, gamma. And this is the raw image without saturation and underexposure. And this is the same image with the gamma, brightness and contrast adjusted. And you can see that uh, this is the correct way to adjust uh, images you acquire this way. And then you push the, uh, the brightness, contrast and gamma to make a nice image that doesn't have a gray background, but you definitely want no underexposure. Yeah, and no saturation, and you fix the brightness, gamma, and contrast after the acquisition, and you always keep a copy of the original. All right, so that's it. Uh, do not, so the bit depth is not the maximum intensity in the image, it's the maximum possible intensities. You would want to never reach the minimum and the maximum, so you have no saturation, no underexposure. And choose the bit depth uh, in your, uh, at which you acquire the images to match the need of your experiment in speed, brightness, and also for the image analysis, file size, etc. Set the imaging parameters to have no saturation and no exposure at all in the areas of interest, and always keep the uh, saturation and exposure, underexposure lookup table on. And then you can change the lookup tables uh, and uh, it does not change the data, except if you play, press apply in Fiji and it only changes how the data is displayed on the computer screen. So look at the histogram to judge uh, your images, especially at the high bit depth. It's quite difficult to actually grasp what you can see. Don't believe your eyes, just look at the histogram. 
And you can change the bit depth from 16 to 8, bit, 8 bits if you want to open the images in a non-scientific software, but uh, don't go high from 8 to 16. Uh, that is totally meaningless. And only change the bit depth on a copy of the original. Always keep the original intact. Always mention any modification in a paper when you, uh, uh, when you publish. And when comparing the intensities between images, always subtract the background if you have been acquiring the images with a camera. And that is because you want to remove the uh, manufacturer offset uh, and always acquire the images with the same bit depth. That's it for this lecture. So now we're, I'm going to talk a little bit about the uh, student imaging uh, challenge. Uh, but uh, first, uh, 